So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this Q&A currently in Marbella at the moment. Not ideal, to be honest, didn't want to come here, although it is an amazing place. I've been a few times before, um, but just finished up with a three week trip in Dubai. And unfortunately, UAE is still on UK red list. So rather than being thrown into a quarantine hotel for 10 days, I decided to come here for 11 and uh, circumvent that whole ordeal. So. Um, yeah, I'll be out here for a bit, spending five days just kind of taking a bit of time off before another crazy two months ahead, and then the rest of the five days getting back to work. So, today I thought I would record a quick Q&A for you guys. Bear in mind, I may not be the most peppy today, I just wrapped up a uh, long fast. So ate about an hour ago, feeling a little tired, but I need to record this today. Because I've been so busy recently, have not been recording many videos, and uh, Tristan is just poor guy in London, just uh, twiddling his thumbs, begging for some content to be uh, thrown his way so he can edit them up. So on that note, let's get into it. Now the first question, and I think this is a dig, but nonetheless I thought I'd answer it. Do you feel embarrassed by the amount of things you buy and your hedonism? Now, let's kind of uh, break that down into a few things. In terms of uh, feel embarrassed by my hedonism, I think for sure at some time, at some points in my life, I am uh, hedonistic. Um, I wouldn't say I'm so much hedonistic, because basically what hedonism means is it's like, it's kind of like a, philosophy or a way of life where you're basically just trying to like maximize pleasure, right? And I don't really think I live like that. Um, you know, if I if I wanted to live like that, honestly, I've, I've made more than enough money, um, like seriously, more than enough money. I could retire with an eight-figure investment portfolio and I could basically just live the rest of my life as a hedonist. So uh, I don't think I prescribe to that nature, but then the other part of it, uh, do you feel embarrassed by the amount of things that you buy? I definitely would not call myself a minimalist, but I also would say, in knowing the amount of money that I make, I would say I'm pretty, um, I'd say that I do pretty well in terms of not buying myself stuff. Uh, to be honest, if I'm ever in a shopping mood, I'm, most of the time I buy stuff for my mom, because uh, I'll be honest, I just don't really get pleasure in buying myself stuff anymore. Uh, as odd as that sounds, like the idea of, and sometimes I think about it, right? I'm like, I've worked really hard this week, and you know, I'll be around Harrods, or let's say, you know, even in Dubai, I was in Dubai Mall, and I was like, I, you know, I should really buy myself something, um, and you know, just give myself a little treat, and there's genuinely nothing that I want, right? There's nothing that I want, and the idea of even buying stuff gives me a bit of anxiety, because I'm just like, ah, just extra stuff in my life. So um, I know that a lot of you guys probably see some of the stuff that I buy um, and you know even some of the questions that I have here you know one's about fashion I'll touch a little bit about kind of what my wardrobe looks like and I know it might come off that I buy a lot of stuff but honestly as I said I'd say I'm pretty tame with that stuff and you know even my friends are, uh, were shocked because they're like oh what com moving company are you going to use when I leave London in six weeks like I'm literally leaving London right forever like I have no storage unit like it's that's it like I have nothing no ties left to London and I'm like I'm not using a storage company I'm just gonna move everything over and I'm gonna try to do it in five suitcases and if I can't do it in five suitcases then it won't come with me so so for that reason I definitely wouldn't call myself a minimalist because a minimalist would just bring one suitcase um, but I would say that I don't really have much attachment to things and um, most of the time when I buy stuff usually like as I said if I buy stuff a lot of times what I'll do as well is I'll buy multiple colors of things um, that I think I'm gonna like and I get it and then whatever I don't like I just give to my friends and for me that was something that was always really important when I didn't have any money well basically my best friend growing up um, his dad was like just this really cool guy and uh, sometimes I'd spend summers with him and it always really like left an imprint of me because he was a very successful business owner and um, like it was really cool for me to see just how like nonchalant he was and how n not attached to physical things he was so much so that he'd buy something and be like ah you know I actually don't really like it and rather than returning it which I know is could be more of a financial uh, a smart financial decision for him he's like you know he just wanted to share his abundance with other people around him like no 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 you, you have it so I guess what I'm trying to say here is uh, on the material side of things uh, definitely there's phases where I go through gluttony I think the thing that I need to work on probably is there are phases where I notice myself. Um, you know, let's say if I'm bored, right? Like it's just a really boring period of my life. I'm, that's usually the times when it pops up where I'm like, oh, maybe I should just go buy myself something and just, you know, reward myself. I've been working really hard recently. And, um, you know, it's really important to, to watch those thoughts because yes, for me, I do have the financial excuse of, you know, I've made a, a good amount of money this month, et cetera, et cetera, but still you should never do something just because you're bored. I think in terms of uh, hedonism, you know, like living your life just for pleasure. I mean, my favorite thing and we'll get onto this in just a second like you know I go through extended periods of monk mode where I have no sugar no caffeine no alcohol um, you know I'm getting nine hours of sleep a night I'm not socializing with anyone 
uh, to me that's not really <laughs> that's not really a headed you know hedonistic lifestyle so um, I'm definitely not uh, someone who uh, prescribes the ideology of hedonism, uh, but definitely I am someone who suffers sometimes for glut uh, with gluttony, which is a sin, you know, it's just like excess, you know, um, and I always have to reel it back in. It's a work in progress. Next question is, if you didn't have an agency already, would you build an e-com or lead gen agency? That is a great question, a very timely one, um, and the answer is lead gen agency. And in fact, so much so that uh, later on in the year, I have Obviously, I'm moving my entire life, moving country at the moment, and the next two months are the culmination of some very, very important projects, basically like three things coming together at once. Um, so this is the busiest I've ever been, honestly. Um, but after that, that allows me some time to shift my focus back to the agency, which was really my main focus for the first two months of the year, uh, and which is why we managed to scale it up quite a lot in that period. But basically what it looks like, what I'll be doing from September and October is, I, obviously I don't wanna leave my agency. You know, we spent three, and as an advertising agency, three, three and a half years building up our reputation that we have with e-commerce and education companies. Um, but basically what I'm gonna be building in September, October is a sister agency. So totally different name, et cetera, et cetera. And that's gonna be for Legion. And we're still deciding what we're we're going to work with whether that be whether that be insurance companies real estate agents uh, car dealerships uh, watch dealers is something i'm also very interested in um but yeah from september october i'm actually going to uh, build another agency um because i just see so much potential in it and usually the the right thing to do is always do the opposite of what everyone else is doing you know when i started working with e-commerce and info product businesses in 2018 no one was you know the the standard of agency wasn't where it is today right and also the competition wasn't where it is today because of the level of uh, complexity that comes with it and i hear people say oh it's no more it's no harder uh, delivering services for e-commerce or info product businesses than it is no shut up like shut up that is so that, that's such a load of crap you know i was literally talking with one of my other buddies the other day who made the transition from uh e-commerce uh business to local legion he, he's like yeah very easily i can manage 50 clients a month like without even thinking about it and if you have 50 e-commerce clients education companies it's it's doable right we've managed to get up to 20 at our agency uh even close to 25 but it's of course there's more complexity than there is with local legion and each client although it falls under the under the bracket of e-commerce or education companies each client is different that's the thing with e-commerce and education and by the way that's not to bash it who knows i might uh start this legion agency and i might hate it uh and i might just you know uh keep going down the track that we have with the education and info product business especially because next year my plan is to start taking equity with clients that we work with and in some instances actually putting my own money forward and injecting my capital into the business as well um so yeah that's not to bash on one it's just like i, I think uh, it's, it's just you, you know over the last year like i've just seen so many people like give such a bad rep to local biz clients and i think the thing is you just need to f pick the right ones right like i'll be honest it's doable but working with uh you know local restaurants it just sucks right so it 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 depends on what local clients or what lead gen clients you're working with, right? That's that's really where the distinction is. It's not a matter of uh, online is better than local biz or this. Like, guys, they all have their uh, they all have their positives and their negatives. So that's all really just to say that um, if I was starting right now and I had nothing, I would actually go for local lead gen. Uh, so much so that you know I'm going to be starting another agency in September October to tr uh, test out that me method and to trial out that model. And the other benefit is with that is with local uh, you know a lead gen agency i can actually hire a salesperson which is the one thing i've never been willing to let go of at my agency because of the complexity of our deals um and i'm very very confident i can scale uh that local lead gen agency to 100k a month because ads for an agency that do local lead gen are easier to get like it's it's easier to get clients through ads if you have a local lead gen agency than it is an online agency and, and that's just the truth because you can make more bold statements right and also you can call it a specific industry whereas with e-commerce unless you're working with like we work with e-commerce fitness brands but then it's just so hard to target you know what i mean so um yeah i guess that there's a little bit of a, a brain dump for you guys the next question is favorite fashion brand except gadget let's see um like here's the thing about my style right um whatever i'm wearing you could probably get for one tenth of the price and, and uh, like i'll explain like right this shirt is a 400 dollar, like 400 dollar, 450 dollar bottega shirt right so this is from bottega veneta like you know but it's just a black shirt and it doesn't say bottega anywhere right like i'm not the type of person to wear brands right and even things like these pants and i'm wearing these like really cool like funky flared pants um like you know these are i actually forget the brand of them but they're like 200 250 pounds so like 350 dollars and my shoes are you know my sandals is funny one of my buddies walked into 
walked into uh, my house and he's like, dude, you look like a Moroccan Uber driver, like your sandals. Um, and you know, these are like 800 and that's, that, I like that, right? I like the fact that he doesn't know what these are, right? And these are $800 Hermes sandals. So my point is like, m m like for you to recreate the same outfit that I'm wearing, right? Maybe except for the sandals, like it, you could do it so easily for like $30, $40. And by the way, that's what I did when I couldn't afford to dress the way that I am, right? So the thing is, I still love fashion. I like spending money on fashion, um, but I also don't like people knowing what I'm wearing or like I don't need people to know what I'm wearing, right? For me, the most important thing is quality. And I will say, you know, I have a bunch of stuff from Uniqlo. I absolutely love, like I adore Uniqlo and Muji. They make amazing stuff for so cheap. And I could get something from Uniqlo that looks exactly the same, but I will say, you know, uh, Part of fashion is also confidence, right? And I know that no one will ever know where this is from, but I do feel, you know, you do just have that little extra pep in your step when you're wearing something that's more expensive. As I said, even if no one else knows, you know. And I think that gives you a little bit of, I don't know, you just feel good in what you're wearing, right? So uh, in terms of my favorite fashion brands outside of Gadget, because as I said, here's the thing, like even if you, and you guys will see when the principal collection launches, you put up a $450 Bottega shirt or, um, you know, like even a, a $450, uh, well, I guess they're slightly different um, materials, you know, like you put up a $450 uh, Laura Piana, like a nice linen blend shirt um, compared to Gadget, like I'll take Gadget any day, like honestly, right? And that's the, why this principal collection has been pushed back for four months now, like we're delayed for four months because I'm so, I'm not gonna release it until it's perfect right and the thing is i'm not comparing it to like i'm like let alone not comparing it to people who have like their own online brands i'm not even comparing it to unique low or muji or i'm not even comparing it to like uh let's say mid-tier brands like i'm comparing it to bottega to laura to Zenia, right and, and yeah that's pretty much why it's been delayed so much so i guess kind of on your question of what are my favorite brands if i look in my wardrobe um i'd say there's a little bit of laurel but i think a lot of their stuff is overpriced and it just I know it just looks a little too old manny for me. Um, whereas something like Xenia, like I think Xenia is, I'd say probably Xenia is my favorite brand. Um, like their stuff is obviously in incredible quality, chic, um, but then it's also like someone of my age can wear it and just still look fly. Whereas I think Laura sometimes is like at my age, it's a little hard to pull off. Um, Bottega, another one. Uh, and then I'm thinking like, and then there's, look, there's so many others. As I said, it also depends on like my favorite brand. If I'm wearing like trousers, if it's, if it's linen specifically, um, like I have a favorite brand for, for all of these. But then I'm thinking like in terms of another brand that actually, I, I, I'd say another brand that is like kind of worse, like, Kind of, because they said like most of the stuff I wear, you could just buy a Uniqlo, and and I recommend you do buy a Uniqlo, you know. Um, and to this day, there's still stuff that like is just so good at at some of these cheap brands that I don't look elsewhere. Like for example, I always wear the Uniqlo gilets. Like I think they're they're so perfect. Like they're just they go with everything. And oh, you yeah, the, the Uniqlo turtlenecks, incredible. Oh, and the other place, uh, the other thing I recommend is a lot of my stuff. Oh, and another one of my favorite brands, especially for a lot of their sweaters, uh, is uh, Zadig and Voltaire. Um, absolutely love their stuff. But another thing that you can do is always go to uh, secondhand stores, right? I have a lot of stuff in my wardrobe and some of my favorite pieces are secondhand store stuff that I then take to my tailor and it just looks, you look like a million bucks, honestly. So yeah, that's pretty much for that. But a brand that I would say is like very like, um, and a little different or or not something that you could necessarily get from you know Uniqlo is um, Rude. I absolutely love Rude, especially their hoodies. I think the Rude hoodies are like, in terms of fit and everything, like they're, they're just my favorite. And then yeah, that's pretty much about it. And then if there's anything specifically that I'm looking for, so like for example these, I've been looking for like some flared sort of like wide pants for a while. Um, I just went on, I just went on Mr. Porter. So I don't know if you have Mr. Porter available to you, but in the UK it's like, it's amazing. There's so many different cool brands and like the overall style is like, kind of uh, the direction that I go in, so yeah. Next question is, what was the most exhilarating thing that you've done in the past year? Why, how, or where? Great question. I'd say definitely running, well, in the last year of boxing, <laughs> like uh, this this time last summer, uh, I was boxing. Um, and once again, again, I guess that kind of uh, relates back to that whole, uh, uh, you know, hedonism point. Like <laughs> I put myself in really unpleasurable situations, you know, getting punched in the face for, I think I, my final fight was 10 rounds is, is not fun. And especially because, I had never boxed before that. Like I was not good. <laughs> like I'm good at many things. I usually get good at things quicker than most people because of constantly putting myself in those uh, interesting situations. Um, but yeah, boxing, I, I can honestly say I was not very good at. Um, so yeah, maybe that like a year ago, you know, literally going to Manchester and uh, uh, you know, getting trained by a professional boxer for six weeks, uh, maybe that or running a marathon uh, with 14 days training. I'd say, I'd say probably that was like so, that, that was just crazy for me. 
Um, so I'd say maybe that. Um, or the other thing is probably like the last round of monk mode I did for like two, two and a half months. Like there's something about monk mode. Like when you're like, I know it doesn't sound fun, right? And everyone can build out their own monk mode. You know, for me, monk mode is uh, no alcohol. Uh, for me, monk mode is no alcohol, no caffeine, no sugar. So I guess for in that I do strict keto diet. Well, actually I do strict carnivore plus, I do carnivore plus avocado. What else is in there? Uh, 20 minutes, well, I've done them before with 20 hours and I've done times with one hour a day of meditation. So 20 minutes a day of meditation uh, and then and then also 45 minutes a day of exercise. And that includes, but basically that's, that's every single day. And yeah, because I've done monk mode periods many times, I add stuff sometimes, I've removed it sometimes. Um, but like that, I, I especially found the one I did in January and Feb, like that was, I just felt so, I, I felt probably the best I've ever felt in my entire life. Um, so I'd say monk mode, even though it's like so peaceful and serene, like it's so exhilarating as well. And you have so much energy, so much energy. I can't even explain it. Next question is best way to get clients with no case studies in 2021. So there's two ways really. The first one is using a profile funnel and really just having a lot more rapport and a lot more touch points before you get on the call, right? Because the thing is, if you have killer case studies, right? If you have killer case studies and you get on a call with someone and that's your first touch point with them, a lot of times you can actually convert them, right? Because you have such a good value proposition. If you don't have any case studies, right? Then you might need to have more touch points with them. And what I mean by that is a lot of people look at outreach as sort of this linear track, but a lot of times you change tracks. And a lot of people also look at sales as this linear track when most people don't realize that when you get on a call with a client, most of the time, 70% of their decision is made before that call. And 70% of the decision is made by First of all, uh, logistics, like what's going on in their business and whether this is the right time for them, because you might meet a client at the right time and the sale is the easiest thing ever. And you might meet a client at a time where they don't feel they need it, or maybe um, maybe they're just focusing on a different part of their business. And uh, you know, no matter how good your sales process, no matter how good your case studies are, you might not sign them during that period. So really the best way to get clients with no case studies is building up a profile funnel. So what I mean by that is whether that be Instagram, whether that be Facebook, whether that be LinkedIn, uh, funnily enough, I've, you know, I've kind of delved into the world of Twitter more as a consumer rather than a producer. I, you know, I'm not, I don't tweet anything at the moment uh, or the past couple months. And I've realized Twitter is actually an amazing place to get clients uh, for your agency and kind of build up a little bit of a niche brand. So it doesn't matter what platform it is, but building up a niche personal brand in there and then posting content that invokes responses and invokes and, and as a conversation starter with your potential clients, that is a profile funnel, right? And especially if you have no case studies, that can be extremely powerful because that can do a lot of the heavy lifting and that can build up a lot of rapport where they don't actually need to even see case studies or regardless of the fact that you don't have case studies, they still feel comfortable moving forward with you. So that's number one. Number two, the other thing that you can do is you can do a paid trials slash discounted trials, right? So when you're selling a client, I never do free trials, they don't work, right? But what you can do is you can make a guarantee, right? Because the thing is, it's almost the same thing, right? You can say, hey, I guarantee this result, and if I don't get it for you, I'll refund your service fee. But really the powerful thing there is you're still receiving the money, but yet you have literally uh, like just absolutely nuked any of their potential concerns, right? Or any of their objections because there's no risk, right? You've literally told them, hey, I'm going to guarantee you this good result, right? And it also needs to be something that's realistic for you. And if I don't get it, you don't pay, right? But they still pay upfront, right? Because, so as I said, you have that big blessing of experiencing what it's like to actually sign a client and receive payment from them and work with them on a paid term. And on their side, it's great because they, like what sort of uh, objections could they have because you've guaranteed a good result for them. So really those are the two methods. And in fact, you can even marry those two methods up together. And that's the best way to go about things if you don't have a case study in 2021. Next question is how do you smoke cigars and still biohack slash detox? Well. Um, well, I was gonna say, if you've noticed, I, I doubt anyone's noticed. Uh, I smoked a cigar during my birthday week, early of January, and then from then on, I didn't smoke for four months because uh, I was in monk mode during that time. So it, basically May, June, and we, we just come up to, yeah, actually we're coming up to July. Basically it's only the two months I've been smoking. I think it's just because, you know, uh, when I do smoke, I post all my stories and stuff like that, or I'll post, you know, whatever box, uh, or I'll post, you know, whatever c cigars. I think maybe people think that I smoke like all the time. Um, it's pretty much like everything, right? It's like alcohol. Like I usually eight months a year, I don't drink alcohol, right? And then four months a year, I do drink alcohol. And, and usually during the times where I'm not doing monk mode, uh, I'd say out of all the things I like the most is probably cigars, uh, even more so than drinking. But in the times when I'm not doing monk mode, which is, you know, very probably only 30% of the year in those times, 
I do like to drink. Right? I like to have either a glass or share a bottle with people at dinner. Um, and as I said, I, I you know for me it's just uh, I'm very and. For some people, they need balance in this and that. For me, I'm a very extreme person, right? So I like to be extreme monk mode, or if I'm enjoying myself, then I enjoy myself. And enjoying myself doesn't mean that, you know, I'm just, that's all I'm doing, right? Because as I said, the past, funny enough, the past two months have been the most busy of my life, and yet I stopped doing monk mode two months ago, and the next two months are the most uh, important of my life, and I'm actually about to do monk mode again now for a six to eight week push. So even when I'm not doing monk mode, I can still function, but definitely not at the same level um, as when I'm doing monk mode. But because I'd, I'd done it so intensely the first sort of quarter uh, onwards of the year, I just felt as I needed some time to enjoy myself, have a glass of red wine here and there, um, enjoy my cigars, uh, and that's that. But really to answer your question, when you're doing cigars, you can still uh, buy it, right? It's like, it's the same thing, it also it depends how many times a week are you doing it, right? Like if you're drinking a glass of red wine every single night, obviously that's not very good, but like, it, let's say even year round, you could do keto, like you could be you could be like very strict with your routine and then Friday and Saturday, that's your day off. So you, if you wanna drink on Friday, Saturday, you can do that or like Friday night, right? So like Friday night and all of Saturday. Uh, or let's say Friday night to Saturday night, that 24 hour window. In that time, then you can enjoy a cigar or you can enjoy sort of, uh, you know, maybe for me, non-keto foods. Um, so yeah, it, it also depends, right? So you can definitely still enjoy cigars and be in excellent, like world-class shape, right? And that's one of the things I, I noticed as well with, um, because the other thing, like Michael Jordan and all these top performers, like they would never, during the season drink right like that would never happen yet they would smoke cigars a lot um, like Michael Jordan even while playing he would smoke cigars um, so that's one thing I, I definitely noticed um, and I've always noticed about like high performances uh, high performers is a lot of high performers still really enjoy their cigars and yeah obviously our cigars aren't great for you like the for sure 100% uh, but they're definitely not you know there is it's not like smoking cigarettes or anything like that and also it's smoking cigars you're not I don't know, it's not like a, a, a impulse thing, right? It's not like something you get addicted to. It's it's more like a, you're really taking your time and you enjoy it. Anyways, my point is, me personally, when I'm having cigars, uh, that's periods where I'm not doing monk mode. Uh, and when I'm doing monk mode, it's just super strict. Next question, difference between agency incubator and copy paste agency, what to choose? Well, it totally depends, right? If you want to get from zero to 10K a month with your agency, agency incubator is your best bet. Now there's people who have gotten into 20, 30, 40, 50, even 100K a month with their agencies using agency incubator, but there is a certain point where what got you here won't get you to your next goal, right? And that's really where copy paste agency comes in play. And that's really where, and not only having all the content in the program itself, plus, you know, 12 hours of a live sales footage inside of the vault where it's not only sales footage it's, it's live demo call sales call onboarding call and then even Danny doing a breakdown of how we got those clients results and literally showing like over the shoulder walkthrough so it's those things plus the ridiculous community plus the fact that because we get so many demos at the agency I actually give clients to CPA students and I actually give referrals to CPA students and you know not only that especially the fact that we talk every Wednesday right there's like no time limit so it's literally unmuted you and I talk it's in a group setting but as I said it's like we're, we're talking like it's literally as if we're like having it's literally as if we're on zoom and we're, we're chatting one-on-one -on -one and you know you get unmuted and you can chat with me for as uh, you know however long you want same thing with the calls on sunday with danny so you know of course copy paste agency is substantially more expensive than agency incubator is it just depends where you are in that journey now you also may be at you know three or four k a month and you're just like i want the highest level of service and then you come to copy paste agency so it, it totally depends the only thing that we really don't Except a copy paste agency is if you're new to the agency game because at that point we'll tell you honestly that it makes sense Probably for you to go into inside of agency incubator grow your agency and then from there evolve into CPA But really if you want to find out more my best recommendation is I think two or three videos ago I uploaded a video called what is copy paste agency and I show you everything fully and then after that Just go to greenc.com slash enroll dash now and that's the agency incubator sales page And you can see a demo a 20 minute demo on there, too So you can kind of get a feel for uh, what the difference is between the two programs next and final question And this is one that I got a lot and that is why Dubai so I think as a lot of you guys know at this point uh, I am actually leaving the UK uh, for good uh, you know, obviously I'll, I'll still spend some time uh, per year there in the first year probably not uh, But after the first year, you know, maybe I'll spend two or three months, maybe a month of the year there um, And a lot of people are asking 
first of all, why am I leaving and why Dubai specifically? Now, I'll make a full, full video when I have moved. Uh, so I actually just am about to sign the lease on my place. Uh, so I'll have the lease August 1st, but I actually won't be moving to Dubai really until September. So the place will actually sit empty for the first month. But as I said, in general, I don't like to talk about things until they're fully, fully done. So I think when I'm actually physically in Dubai and I've made the move, I'll make a full video explaining why, because it is a, like I try not to think about it too much because um, it makes me really sad. Like I've been, I've been living in London 17 years. Like I love that place so much. Like I have, I think I'm very like protective over London um, and I'm like genuinely the biggest London fanboy ever um, because I don't know, like moving from Dagestan where I'm from, like, you know, I'll get, uh, I'll get, I'll try, I'll get Tristan to like throw up some footage of like what it actually looks like where I'm from. Cause like most people don't understand that like growing up, like I had no toilet, like the, f and bear in mind, this is also the first four years of my life. It's not like I really grew up like this, but like just to give you an understanding of where I'm actually from, like there's no toilet. You know, I grew up in my grandma's house. You know, you leave the house, you take a right, you go maybe 20 meters down past the chickens, past the cows, like all the vegetation and you go and you squat and you, you do your thing, right? Uh, in a hole, right? So to go from that and to go from nine black and white channels to 999 color channels to, you know, being in London to like being around all this wealth and like, you know, as well for me, I had such a weird childhood and I've, I've talked about this before. Um, I don't know if you, if you haven't heard about it, maybe just go see one of the longer videos I've done. Like I had such an interesting childhood where through some wizardry for my mom and you know, my mom and my stepdad's marriage, which was a very, very weird, uh, very weird thing. You know, basically I never, you know, I didn't really have a relationship with my stepdad. I never saw him, but the benefit for, uh, you know, my mom and I uh, was I actually went to private school, right? So like going to private school paid for by my stepdad, but then uh, him not giving us any money. Like it was just this whole weird thing where, as I said, we grew up going to private school and I'd say probably around until the age that I was like eight or 10, like things weren't super bad. Um, you know, we weren't like a super, like we didn't live super lavish, but things weren't super bad. Uh, but by the time that I was 12, like, you know, uh, we had been like fully cut off and uh, you know, my mom hadn't been working for like 10 years at that point. Um, and you know, for the next five years between like 2012 and 2017, like things were really rough. And you know, part of the reason that we were able to make it through it was, you know, my mom and I were on government benefits at some point, which is the same thing as like uh, welfare in America. So I directly benefited from taxpayer money. And my mom actually was the front uh, receptionist uh, for, I think she worked there for like a year uh, at the NHS, uh, the one in like Chelsea and Westminster. So yeah, she was working minimum wage at the NHS, which for those of you guys that don't know, the NHS is like the government, like the free government healthcare in the UK. So I've always been super protective over the UK of the NHS of like just the country in general. Like I've always had so much respect. Um, yeah, I've always just had so much respect for the UK, but it's just, um, I don't know. I'm just, uh, I'm done. Like I'm, I'm done with the UK. Um, I mean, I've never liked the U S to be honest. Um, and I think anyone like, I don't know, like, uh, uh, maybe some of you guys are, are patriotic, uh, which I totally understand, but like I've, I don't know, I, me personally, I, I just think, um, and this isn't new for me. This has been ever since I was young, I've always looked at America and just been like, and that place looks like it's, it's in shambles. So yeah, I said like, you know, but on that point, actually, you know, I would always look at uh, growing up, like when, even when I was like 15, 16, I would look at, I would look at America and I'd be like, ha, huh, you know, um, what a, what an absolute like shithole compared to the UK, which is just so brilliantly run in this. And um, now I'm in that same situation where I, I genuinely look at the UK with disgust and basically it's everything that's happened in the last uh, year, year and a half. Um, I do not, I cannot stand by uh, the UK's actions. Um, I can't stand by the US's actions. I can't, I, I just think they're all evil and they are, they are all evil. And then furthermore, um, you know, I was always up until the last year, I was always such a proud taxpayer. Um, and I'm still a very, very, very heavy taxpayer. Um, just not a proud one anymore. Um, because you know, let's say even for example, Dubai, right? Um, you look at Dubai, there's zero percent taxes. The roads are way cleaner. And by the way, look, I, I get it. Dubai has a lot more natural resources and Dubai is Dubai because of what it is. Right. But you look at the UK and you look at, quite frankly, you look at where money is spent. Right. And you look at, you know, I look at the fact that 300 million pounds has just been, um, contracted to advertising for the whole thing that's going on. Right. 
And as I, everyone is entitled to their own opinions about everything that's going on in the world, uh, I think it's one of the biggest uh, frauds in history. I honestly don't think it takes more than a second grader level of intelligence to figure that out. Uh, that this has nothing to do with your safety and everything to do with control and power. Um, I said, I, I really don't think it, it takes much to figure that out. Um, so for me personally, I don't want to be a part of a country that I think is evil. Um, and also maybe if I know what I knew now about like, just like, I, I mean, it's once again, as I said, I, I don't think it, I don't, I don't think you need a high level of intelligence to realize that every, pretty much every single war that these countries have started, it, they've started themselves. Right. Um, and I even remember watching stuff when I was younger, even like eight years old and just being like, mm, you know, like even watching stuff about nine 11, even when I was even eight years old and I was like, maybe it's the Capricorn in me that like questions everything. And I was like, that doesn't quite seem right. You know? Um, so yeah, I don't know. When you just look into the history and you look at all these false flag of events, when you look at where taxpayer money is actually going, um, and you look at the fact that, I don't know, quite frankly, I just think these are like disgusting, like tyrannical countries that I want no part of, no part of. And uh, then comes the question of, you know, why Dubai? And uh, Dubai and UAE, for me personally, I, I want it to be a part of a country that I think is going in the right direction. And wow, like I, 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 I mean, here's the thing, I, I, like, I hadn't been to Dubai in 14, like I hadn't been to Dubai in, no, like 12 years since I went, like, you know, just a week ago. So I really had no idea like what to expect when I arrived. And look, obviously like I had great admiration for what Dubai had built over the last, what, 40 years, 50, yeah, 40 years, something like that. Um, but I was still concerned that it would be like, the operations wouldn't be good or things would be slow there. And like, you know, it wouldn't be, like it wouldn't have all the allure of the UK, the US, like these first world countries. And honestly, and this hurts to say, cause I've, as I said, I've always been such a, like London is like, will always be a part of me, right? And I, the only passport that I hold at the moment I, is a British passport, right? Uh, I don't consider myself Russian. I also don't consider myself British, but like, you know, like London is part of my heart. And, um, it, it pains me to say this because like I would always laugh at the US and the way that like the US was run in comparison to UK and I would always be like like even even just simple things like airports right like just go to Heathrow and compare that to what uh, JFK um, like it's it's nine day difference like it's just like you would you honestly you go to US I, for me I feel like I'm in a third world country but then comparing some of the stuff in the UK for example even like as simple as creating a bank account you know a year ago I created a separate company for my investments and it took me four months to get a bank appointment and i get it it was because this whole thing was going on right um and that was their excuse for it but there no there is no excuse there is no excuse for having someone who is a bank customer of yours and has been a customer of yours for five years and you won't let them open up a new bank account right because in the uk right now I, how insane is this they're not opening up any new bank accounts right maybe now they are but you know when i was trying for the past you know for a nine month period they weren't doing it they weren't uh, setting any appointments so i compare that to the fact that within 21 days I had my UAE company created I had my visa issued they did a medical right so I had I had uh, the visa application started so company was created like all of the uh, incorporation stuff was dealt with the the lease agreement because obviously in the U in the UAE there are little quirks that you have to deal with that you know for example uh, don't apply in the UK like you actually physically need an office in the UAE well technically need an office, uh, right? But the point is there needs to be some office space technically. Um, so obviously there's things that uh, need to be dealt with in there. And, and granted, I have the most expensive tax advisors and lawyers that you can buy, right? Like granted, I have incredible representation for this because as I said, you know, I needed everything to be done to a T. I, you know, the one thing that you never want to mess with is tax. Uh, as I said, you know, I mentioned before, I uh, went from being a proud taxpayer to a non-proud taxpayer. Yes, but I'm still, a taxpayer and I want to do a by the book and uh, and I want to make sure that there are never any uh, that's just one thing just don't mess with right like when it comes to like legal stuff and this and that just just make sure you, you're doing it properly so uh, I will say I had great representation but even just looking at the UAE the fact that in 21 days I had my all my company stuff sorted before I even landed right I went through the visa process I had my medical they actually uh, take your blood and then uh, x-ray and stuff this and that then I had my passport brought back to me with my visa stamp, my Emirates ID, all my, there's a bunch of other uh, stuff that was given to me. Uh, and then my, and then I went from, and then on the last day I went for my bank account creation and my personal bank account was created that same day. Within, within the next 12 days, I'll have my business bank account created. And just the whole process, like everything in Dubai was so seamless. Like it was about as perfect as, as like the way that it was run, it was about as perfect as you could get it. 
every single restaurant I went to, about as perfect as it gets. Um, just the, the level of service, the level of pride there, um, the level of pride about perfection, like I was inspired by that place. So why Dubai specifically? Because I think they're going, they've been going in the right direction and I think they're gonna continue going in the right direction. Now, the other thing is they haven't done a lockdown in a year, right? Uh, the only unfortunate thing there is you have to wear masks. Now, it is totally dependent on what happens with their stance on uh, needing the experimental thing, you know, that I'm not gonna uh, mention the name of. Um, if they force you to get that in order to go to restaurants or gyms and you need a, a, a digital uh, a certification, then I will not be staying in Dubai. And that's also why actually, as a part of you know my, my tax advisors and my, uh, my lawyers, it's a whole plan that we've uh, been executing on. One of that is actually getting Mexican residency. So yeah, as of next month, I will have my Mexican residency. So I have a Mexican visa, I can stay there as long as I want. Um, and I'm also been getting my Russian passport back again. So I have a British passport, Russian passport, UAE visa and Mexican visa. And where I end up with, uh, you know, where I end up will be 100% dependent on uh, the way that they deal with this whole situation. Because as I said, I am not willing to live in a country that is tyrannical. I'm not willing to live in a country that um, doesn't care about its citizens. I'm not willing to live in a country that uh, wants to extort its citizens. Uh, and I realize more and more that uh, taxation at the level that it is, is extortion. Um, and, and, and it's funny, you, and, and the US is a perfect example of that, right? You look at, uh, you look at Texas compared to California. You know, California highest uh, uh, state uh, tax rates in all the US, literally the biggest shithole, like disgusting. And, and you compare that to a place like Texas, right? So I look at, now I look at like, for example, if we compare UK and Dubai, you know, for example, if you compare UK and UAE, or I look at the, I look at the UAE as Texas, or I look at the U UAE as Florida, and then I look at, you know, the UK as California, where it's just like, you're paying so much more and you're getting so much less. And as I said, this isn't actually about taxes for me. It's just for me, if I was going to make this big life change, I want to get compensated for it. And you know, some of the other places that we were looking at, um, for me, actually it went, it came down to UAE, Portugal, Italy, or Switzerland, right? Because with Portugal, Italy, and Switzerland, um, you, you negotiate your own tax rate. Like in, in places like that, they have schemes, right? And you just, depending on how much you're worth, like they'll tell you a tax rate and you just pay like a, almost like a flat retainer. So in Italy, it was actually hundred K a year. So for me, I was like, okay, I get to stay in Europe and live in Italy. Um, and I pay hundred K a year tax, like no matter if I make, no matter how much money I make, right? So like for me, the tax rate was like so, so low. So I was like, all right, bet I'm going to Italy. And I thought about it a bit more and I'm like, I don't know, like I think Italy is an incredible place, but as I said, that idea of where Dubai is and where it's going, or UAE I should say, um, it excites me and I, and I wanna be a part of it. Uh, and definitely there's things that I don't like um, and definitely Dubai is like the last place on earth I ever imagined myself living. Yeah, like I'm, I, you know, in London, like I live in, Knightsbridge, you know, I, I don't have a car because I like to walk everywhere and I like culture and I like beautiful buildings and, you know, Dubai, of course, has some beautiful buildings, but not like uh, the way that I like them, right? So I'm, I'm definitely a European kind of person. Um, but as I said, you know, Dubai, it excites me. I think it's going in the right direction. Uh, but as I said, if I feel it's not going in the uh, right direction and if I feel as though I don't align with where it's going, then as I said, I'm gonna move. And and probably if that happens, I'll end up moving to uh, Mexico. Uh, Cause also, once again, I don't, as a country, I don't think they're going in, the, I don't think they're, you know, innovative in the same way that, I don't think they're innovative in the same way that uh, UAE is, you know, I don't think they're like uh, the, like the country to look for, you know, the country to look at as like, uh, wow, they're doing something incredible. But what I love about Mexico is there's a lot of liberty there, right? Uh, and they respect people's liberty uh, and they respect people's uh, freedoms. And, and you know, Mexico is not tyrannical in the same way the US or the UK is. So it's funny, because I said I really wouldn't reveal much of what I'm thinking, but I mean, th there's so much more uh, that I, obviously I, I do want to talk about and I'll talk about like kind of how my company structure is set up, um, who I worked with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how long the process took, like a little bit more about it. Cause as I said, it's, it's not just the UAE, it's like a multiple pass, it, you know, it's getting passports and residents. Uh, and then it's not only the UAE, there's like other companies. And, and then obviously as I said, I work with very expensive tax specialists, not only one, I, I've worked with multiple firms around the world to make sure that each thing doesn't breach a tax law in a different country of that. You know, basically it's all super by the book, which, which is why obviously I have no issue sharing it with you guys when it's fully executed and stuff like that. So yeah, I'll make a longer video when I'm, sat in Dubai in my new place and everything's been done. So ladies and gents, 
I hope you guys enjoyed this Q&A. As always, if you wanna be drawn in to win a pair of Gadgy G1s, all you have to do is comment down below as well as like the video and check back in the next video. And, and the winner will be one of the pinned comments down below. And as always, you can check the pinned comment down below this video to see if you've won. This looks like it's been a very long video, so I hope you guys enjoyed this off the cuff Q&A. And I will catch you guys next time. Look, if you enjoyed that video, I went ahead and picked out another special video that I know you're going to find immensely valuable. You can find it right there. I know you're going to love it and I'll see you in the next one.